and there's been a large. Uh, Mill on the Floss is much shorter, uh, which means it's a really long book. Uh, <laughs> but uh, today I'm going to do a lot of biographies, so I'm hoping this is some un uncharted territory even for those who've done the Mill Marjorie. Okay. Um, and, and that's partly because um, George Eliot, Marian Evans, has such a compelling life story. Uh, it's so, it's really, I mean, not that other authors don't, but hers is really particularly sort of fascinating and conflicted uh, and difficult. Um, and so, and, and Mill on the Floss is often seen as her most autobiographical novel. Um, and so, you know, you can't always tell everything from the autobiography or the life story to the novel. But this is the, her novel in which it will make the most sense to think about her, her life. Um, so, I did want to start with a quote. Well, that's actually George Owen's picture. Um, and there's a quote from Eliot about her sort of goals in her novel writing. Um, she, wrote, she wrote in her uh, notebooks that she wanted her fiction to explore, quote, great turning points in history by depicting in detail not only, quote, the various steps by which a political or social change was reached, but also the pathos, the heroism, often accompanying the decay and final struggle of old systems, which has not had its share of tragic commemoration. So she's, and you can tell from this quote, you know, once she's really interested in historical and social change, right? She sets that out as sort of like one of the primary purposes of her fiction. Um, but she's also deeply emotionally invested and sees this as a sort of emotional event, right? This tragic commemoration, this pathos of the old system. She views historical change in very emotional terms. And that's one of the things I want us to think about, too. And again, I just want to highlight what she sees as this tension between political and social change and then the heroism of old systems. In a sense, she's really interested in, the, in those moments that are really neither one nor the other, not completely in the past and not completely new, but people and events that are on the cusp of change. Um, and again, if we go back to that first quote, she wants to examine this kind of change in detail through her novels. It's a very interesting way for a novelist to think about what they do, right? Again, very historically minded. Um, okay, so. To kind of give the overview of what we're going to talk about today, what I want to emphasize is there are three really important major conflicts in her life leading up to the publication of The Mill on the Floss. And I want to examine each of them in terms of how she was involved or caught up in political and social change. Um, the first kind of occurs uh, after the, around the death of her mother, her early adolescent evangelicalism. So she in around between 12 and 17, she's caught up in sort of evangelical Christianity and fervor uh, and takes it on, despite her family having a very different relationship to Christianity. That becomes one of her first sort of crises of her life. Um, the second is when she kind of declares this holy war, which she calls this holy war, when she stops uh, attending Anglican church and begins to really question Christianity. Um, and the third is her quote unquote marriage to George Henry Lewis in the 1850s. So each decade in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, she experiences a real, a deep emotional and spiritual crisis that we can kind of tie back to some historical changes and also pave the way for kind of the questions she's dealing with in the law. Before I get to this, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about her upbringing, growing up as George Eliot. Uh, she was well positioned 
uh, based on her background to understand the enormous changes that were happening in early and mid-Victorian England. Um, she was the third and last child of Robert Evans, who is a manager of the Newdigate Estate. Um, and so what he does, he's not, so he works for a sort of the local squire or the local aristocrat. And he's sort of the middle person who tends the estate, makes sure all the people who are renting land on the estate, all of the uh, workers who are who, like, craftspeople who are needed to keep the estate going are being paid. You know, he's sort of, an, in a way, maybe an overseer. Right? So he has this really interesting position, Robert Evans, right, between a sort of aristocrat right, and a local squire and everyone else who lives in the area. Right? And the economy was basically you know, revolved around the local aristocrat's estate. Right? So he would, Robert Evans, uh, Marion Evans' father, would really know everyone and would have a really fine sense of sort of social hierarchy, right? since he was, in a sense, managing everyone's wages, their relationships between the craftspeople and townspeople and the aristocratic uh, uh, squire. So you can have that very fine sense and also be a sort of a well-known figure in the area. Right? He's not just someone who is on the outskirts or on the sidelines of society. He's really right in the center of what's going on. Um, her childhood was spent in Griff House, a substantial farmhouse. That's a picture of her father. This is Griff House, where she grew up. And you can see, you know, it's something befitting. This is not someone who's poor, right? Um, obviously, it's not a you know a mansion or a great estate, but it's it's quite I mean, it's quite nice, right? You know, it's quite big, uh, has plenty of windows and you know, uh, you know decorative rooms. Uh, so it, it's someone it, it befits someone who's living sort of between the local aristocrat and sort of everyone else in the area. Right? It's a sort of central place. Uh, it's now I I believe a bed and breakfast and inn. Um, so you can go stay there. Um, but, uh, so critic Rosemary Bodenheimer suggests that from this position in, in the rural middle class, she was well positioned to see the full spectrum, spectrum of English life. So I want to read this quote from uh, Rosemary Bodenheimer about uh, Eliot's early life. She was initiated early into the farm and dairy work of women, while her father's work brought him in direct working relationship with people of every status, from the squire, the Newgate family who employed and relied on him, through the local farmers, coal miners, canal workers, clergy, tradespeople, craftsmen, and laborers. The Evans family was not genteel, but it was respectable and ambitious of practical excellence within the terms of conservative, customary, royal, rural society. So she grew up in a culture that emphasized hierarchy and was based on aristocratic ideology. In other words, you know, you couldn't just do anything or be anyone. It's a very traditional society. Uh, typically, what, where your parents were located in society was where you were. Right? What your parents did as a trade or a profession was typically where you were. Um, where custom, ritual, and the natural cycles of agricultural life more or less govern people's everyday existence. Right? They were farmers for the most part. Even the squire, most of his money came from agriculture. Right? So everyone's really involved in the kind of customary rituals of that kind of life. Um, and the way it you know, can be a sort of gender. Like, what roles in agriculture that women particularly had, right, which were really important. Um, if you read Middlemarch, women have a particular place in uh, British rural agricultural society. Um, and there's a sort of web of dependency in this, in this culture. Right? You know everyone, everyone knows you, you're dependent on people above you, as well as people below you expect certain kinds of behavior from you. She had, one of her most important early relationships is with her older brother, Isaac. Um, and they were close companions early in life. 
this will be super important from you for you when you're when you're reading Mill on the Floss for the first time. You'll pick it up, and in the first chapter, you'll know there's something autobiographical here because she writes about the relationship between Maggie and Tom, uh, the two young kids who start off Mill on the Floss, with such uh, insight and with such detail. You know, you'll feel like, oh, this is someone who really lived this. Um, and, and she does have that kind of relationship with her brother Isaac. And they're inseparable as early, you know, as young children, up until around five and eight when they're sent to different schools. Uh, but still in contact with each other, it's still in the same local area. Um, and we'll come back to Isaac later on. This is a picture of him later in life. He plays a really important role, not just in her childhood, but in the rest of her life. So, and I want to read you, I, I have a, just a couple of quotes from Mill and the Floss in my presentation. Um, so I, there are no spoilers, um, so you don't have to worry about that. But I, this is a great quote about Tom and Maggie that relates to her relationship with her brother Maggie. Life did change for Tom and Maggie, and yet they were not wrong in believing that the thoughts and loves of these first years would always make part of their lives. We could never have loved the earth so well if we had had no childhood in it. If it were not the earth where the same flowers came up again every spring that we used to gather with our tiny fingers as we sat listening to ourselves on the grass, the same hips and haws on the autumn hedgerows, the same red breasts that we used to call God's birds, because they did no harm to precious crops. What novelty is worth that sweet monotony where everything is known and loved because it is known? And if we kind of think back to that first quote I started with, where she talks about, you know, wanting to explore the pathos of the older system and its staying power, right, even as there is political and social change, and we kind of compare how she describes even human relationships. The idea that we love things because we know them, because they're familiar to us, right? Um, and this deepens our, in, in, a, in a sense of this quote, it's almost like the whole meaning of your life is tied up in, you know, your first couple of years and what you know and what you expect and the familiar. Yeah. Did you comment on her change from third person yeah. Um, so the where we are, we we. Um, it, I mean, uh, um, Elliot's narrative voice is really fascinating, right? And people remark a lot on it how this narrative voice kind of jumps in. And in Mill and the Floss, um, you'll, there'll be moments where it's like I, and, and and this I is never identified. I am looking back on the floss, and I see it's you know I'm remembering back to. This, my knowledge of Maggie or knowing Maggie 50 years ago. It's very strange. Um, and I mean, I think I want, I want to leave a little bit more of this for our next discussion, but I think that's something you want to pay attention to, you want to think about, right? Like, what is this narrative voice doing who jumps in and says, we? Um, and we can talk just a little bit about our thoughts about that. Yeah. Pardon me for interrupting your train of thought. Speaking of her autobiographical yeah. recollection of her childhood, was there a river by where she grew up? That is a good question. I am sure there was a river, but I don't know her relationship to it, you know, growing up. Um, I, have to, I have to look at that. Um, at the same time, you know, that sense of being in love with things because we're familiar with them. I also want to kind of set something else, throw something else into the mix. So here's another quote from the narrative voice, kind of uh, talking to us, explaining things to us. It's a very sort of, um, I don't, if, I guess, avuncular in a way, narrative voice, right? You know, like caretaking, like here's what you need to know, people. Um, it was a time, and she's, again, this is from Mill on the Floss. It was a time when ignorance was much more comfortable than at present, and was received with all the honors in very good society without being obliged to dress itself up in an elaborate costume of knowledge. A time when cheap periodicals were not. A time when ladies in rich, rich silk gowns wore large pockets 
who would say carried a mutton bone to secure them against the crown. I don't trust. Mrs. Legg, <laughs> Mrs. Legg carried such a bone which she had inherited from her grandmother with a brocaded gown that would stand up empty like a suit of armor and a silver-headed walking stick. For the Johnson family had been respectable for many generations. And I'm sort of curious about, if we can think about the contrast between the idea that we love things because we know them and because we're familiar with them, and the sense of this quote. I mean, this is giving us another sense of you know, tradition and the past, isn't it? I mean, what, what's different about this quote? What do you see is different? Well, the other one, one is very fond of remembrance, and this one is making a little stab, a little joke. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, they were all idiots back then. <laughs> I mean, you know, so sort of like, like, the idea that not only, you know, were you, did you carry around a mutton bone to secure you against the cramp, I have no idea you know, what a that gut would have, but it certainly sounds like an unpleasant you know, kind of tradition. Um, but the idea that she inherited the bone from her grandmother, right, with this, you know, the same dress, um, and you know, everyone is just doing these things because their parent or grandmother did them, um, and there are, feel no obligation to explain why, right? Uh, ignorance was much more comfortable than at present. You could just go around with a mutton bone in your, you know, dress, and <laughs> you no know, one would ask you because that's what everyone did, right? And there would be no explanation or even thought about it, right? No one would even think, why are we carrying mutton bones around? And, you know, it's just like, well, I've got a mutton bone. Um, grandma did it, so. So there's this kind of tension between loving the familiar but also the sense that there are problems with tradition and custom, right? They can inhibit individual thought and reflection. We're all running around with mutton bones, but we don't know why. Right? And then this kind of, I think, brings us back again to that quote we started with, right? Where we have this sense of, like, the pathos of the older systems and the tradition, at the same time wanting to document social and political change and be aware of it, right? Um, Eliot's really caught in this tension between loving tradition and custom and sort of being skeptical of it at the same time. And I don't think it's anything that, I mean, if you ever could resolve that, right? I don't think it's something Eliot ever resolves, right? It's really more one of those productive tensions. She's always thinking about why we're drawn to tradition, right? Why we love the familiar things that we love, but also, you know, what the, what the dangers are of that, right? That kind of unthinking. Yeah? Thank you. In a room here where the, we have a, a good uh, balance of the female gender, it strikes me that, especially in that quotation, brother, she is a philosopher. And yet when we think of Immanuel Kant and some people, we never think of women. Uh, and yet I, I'm going to say that, that, that having read the book, that she's, and that quote, she's quite a philosopher. Oh my goodness, yes. And Eliot would be, you know, I think, so happy that you see her as a philosopher. I mean, you know, one of the things is she studied philosophy, you know, probably, so when we get to her adult life a little bit later on, um, we'll see that she's deeply involved in kind of the most progressive, liberal, philosophical thinking of her day. Um, and she knew more, and you know, not to be mean to men, but she knew more about philosophy than most of the men she worked with. Um, and it, there must have been a lot of frustration for her about knowing so much, um, you know, and working with people who weren't as smart as her, but could get ahead um, because they were men. Um, I mean, that was a position she had always been in her life, um, and, and part of maybe her relationship with her brother Isaac. Uh, you'll see it between Maggie and Tom in Mill on the Floss. Uh, the fact that Maggie is super smart and perceptive young girl, uh, and as she grows up into a woman, uh, and Tom is not super smart, her older brother, and yet she often feels beholden to Tom. Um, so that that really plays itself out. But like, if you just think about, you know, one of her her last novel, Daniel Deronda, which concerns one of the characters who's Jewish uh, and kind of involves the move uh, back to Israel and Zionism, emerging Zionism. She learned Hebrew 
in order to read Jewish texts, in order to write about a Jewish character. So I mean, she, this is you know kind of what she did. Um, is this a, a comfortable thing that you mentioned earlier? Is that a, sort of similar to in the last century, the gentleman C in college? <laughs> Uh, where, yeah. Where it, actually, you, you, you would be mis distrusted if you were getting B's and A's. Yeah, I, mean, I think you know there is a sort of um, yeah. I mean, I think what she's talking about in, the, in that quote is just like people who just follow tradition strictly, right? Like we're just like I don't know why I'm doing it, but this is what this is what we do. But yeah, I think there's also the sense that, and again, this kind of comes up in the little plus Maggie and and I'm sure Elliot too. We're very frustrated with people who didn't try. Now, George Eliot was someone, <coughs> you get the sense, who always, and when we talk about our crises, always wor worked really hard, thought really hard about what she was doing. And I think it frustrated her that other people could go through life without doing that, right? That things, not, not that things were even easy for them, but that sort of thinking about life was easy for them. They were comfortable in their position. Right? That was, I think, very frustrating for Elliot, who was never comfortable in their position. Um, you know, and so at 16, she's, her mother dies, and she's brought back home from school to basically become the caretaker of the house, right? the woman of the house. She's now the oldest woman in the family, and so she has to take on that role for her father and for her brother. This you can see for someone for a super, a very very smart uh, adolescent or you know young woman, right? That's difficult. She's been at school. She's been in sort of learning things. Now she's going to go back home and run the house, which isn't. It's not like it's an easy task, right? It's quite a complicated position in Grid House. There are lots of servants. There are lots of connections um, to other parts of the community. But it's a different kind of life. And while she had been at school, she forms a very close relationship with Maria Lewis, who's one of her teachers, who is an evangelical Christian, uh, which is not the background that Elliot comes from at all, and would have been quite suspect to her family. Her family is Anglican Church of England, which was the established church. Right? So for her to kind of move away from that was a real sort of rebellion and sort of adolescent crisis in a way. I mean, we can think about being an adolescent and sort of wanting to distinguish herself from her family. Um, Maria Lewis, her teacher, provides her this opportunity. Um, and, and, you know, um, <coughs> I wanted to get to a quote she, she writes, which is about 16 to Maria. She's already home. Um, and someone has, she's just heard about a local engagement um, between a couple uh, in her town. And she, she writes, and, and you'll hear her devotion to her new ideas. I can only sigh for those who are multiplying earthly ties, which, though powerful enough to detach their heart and thoughts from heaven, are so brittle as to be liable to be snapped asunder at every breeze. Uh, you know, rather than I'm so happy, you know, John and Mary found each other. <laughs> I must believe that those are happiest who are not fermenting themselves by engaging in projects of earthly bliss, who are considering this like merely a pilgrimage, a scene calling for diligence and watchfulness, not for repose and amusement. Um, so obviously, marriage is one of those cases of repose and amusement, uh, but she imagines people are happy. Um, and, you know, really warning them. <laughs> I know. It's not even like they're going on a date or anything. They're getting married, right? Um, that, you know, really calls for that you can see the sort of, you know, Elliot or Evans, Marion Evans, right, has completely, you know, this is her way of relating to the community around her now as a sort of 16 year old, 17 year old. No one is as sort of devoted as she is, no one else sees through you know, the superficiality of community life the way she does, right? And there's a really kind of, obviously, kind of judgmental tone here, very harsh, right? Uh, but we also have to think about how her evangelicalism ties her to some broader changes. Yeah? Don't you think that as a 6th general, that would be kind of typical because she would like real experience and personal relationships in the world? I mean, very... Yeah. Good point, so... Yeah. Like 
Yes, it's very much a And you know, I think maybe also the relationship with Maria Lewis, her teacher, is part of this, right? Like I have this special relationship with my teacher, and we all know how the rest of you, you know, and now she's being forced to go back home where you know everyone just does things out of you know tradition and she has this new perspective on things. So yeah, I think it is it makes a lot of sense. And add to that that her mother has just died, right? You know, that's gonna, I think in a way, um, maybe make her more skeptical of what's going on in the community or more dis feel more distance from alienated from everything that's going on for her. Um, but we also I would also want to think a little bit about evangelicalism at the time. Um, it's really associated with sort of uh, tradespeople and more of an urban working class, but also, and I think this is key, women, right? Evangelicalism kind of stresses individual faith and knowledge more and less hierarchy than the Anglican Church did. And in fact, many evangelical um, groups had women preachers, which would you know was this a sort of public place for women that was not very common in Victorian England, certainly not in religious circles, right? The idea that you could be a preacher as a woman, you could go out publicly and preach to crowds of people, and if you read Adam Bede by George Owen, you'll see that too. Um, and in fact, her aunt um, was a Methodist, her aunt and uncle were Methodists, and her aunt at one time had been a, a preacher. Um, so, and she formed a very close relationship at that time with her aunt. So you can see, in, in addition to kind of being a very sort of personal kind of response to every situation, right? The kind of adolescent kind of like, I know more than everyone else. Um, I have a friend who once said, uh, she overheard someone in her church saying, uh, you know, kids come back from college thinking they know more than the Lord, right? And so I think that's a little bit like what George Eliot was going through. See everyone else saying, oh, she thinks she knows more than Laura now. Um, but it's also, evangelicalism also gave an opportunity to really develop and encourage her independent thinking, and also the idea that women were critical and important members of a religious community that, that could be active, that had agency. So I want to move on to our, our second crisis. So the, I, you know, but I also want to think about that in the end, the way she resolves that crisis of moving back home and kind of recovering after her mother's death is this sort of like a little bit with tradition, a little bit not. Right? She kind of takes on evangelicalism, which is a sort of more or less accepted uh, religious position um, for her. But she also uses it, I think, as a way of reimagining herself as a female public intellectual. Right? She does a little bit both. She goes through it in a way, but in a way that's already been, the path has been set out for her. Her second crisis comes about six or seven years later. So she's in her 20s. Uh, and her brother Isaac marries, which means her role as housekeeper is no longer open, right? Because his wife, Isaac's wife, is now going to take over Griff House, and she'll be without a role. She and her father moved to Coventry, or closer to Coventry, about, about five miles where they were. And being in a populous, more populous area, more of an urban area, brings her into contact with more people outside the family. She uh, falls sort of in friendship with Charles and Cara Bray. Um, and Charles, Brett, Charles and Carol Bray were abolitionists. They were very forward thinkers. Uh, in Victorian England, there's a whole kind of tradition of socialism, right? Uh, these are wealthy industrialists who sort of have money to donate to or to kind of create good works projects. But interestingly enough, Cara and Charles have an open marriage. They each have uh, lovers and they each know about each other's having affairs. Um, and this is how the marriage works. So you can imagine, this is quite a shift for George Eliot or Marianne Evans, right? You know, growing up in a traditional household, becoming evangelical, and now she's with sort of these socialist rabble-rousers who are living in an open marriage. And there's some suggestions 
you know, some, some people think she might have had been in love with Charles Gray or had an affair with Charles Gray. It's not terribly hard to imagine she's in her early 20s. And, um, but it was a fascinating, also a fascinating environment for her. Since the Brays had money and were also intellectuals at the time, they had uh, people uh, in active houses, the leading intellectuals. Ralph Waldo Emerson came and uh, spent time with the Brays. So they were kind of at a hub of a kind of exciting intellectual life. That's a picture of Charles Bray. Um, so as, a, as a result of this, in 1842, she tells her father she's no longer going to church. Right? So if he hadn't been sort of like put on guard by the evangelicalism, right, now he's like, you know, this is sort of over the top. This is extreme for him. He, he and the family are certain people who go to church every week, Anglican church. They don't have, I guess, a lot of enthusiastic belief, but they also believe it's your duty to kind of show up every week for church. Right? So, you, you know, this is the kind of tradition George Eliot almost hated. Right? This is like wearing a mutton bone in your pocket. Right? You're going to church every week, even though you haven't thought about what you believe. You've never questioned it, you've never thought about it, you've never read any of the texts in detail that you're discussing or thinking about in church, right? You're just going there to show up. So, you know, she, of course, throws a wrench into that and says, I'm not going anymore. I have too many questions about Christianity. Um, so this goes on for some time, <laughs> this, this idea, this war between her and her family. Um, Isaac is particularly upset by her, her, brother, her older brother, her father is particularly upset. Um, this feels like a crisis in the family. This, it's a, sort of a public statement to not go to church anymore. Everyone will know. It's not something you, you keep in. So eventually, she agrees to go back to church as long as her family acknowledges her questioning of Christianity. Since they had never really you know, thought about the idea of questioning or not questioning Christianity, it really didn't make much difference to them. I mean, they were like, yeah, whatever, you know, question away, girl, you know. Uh, but what they wanted was the tradition, right? They wanted the, in a sense, the mutton bone in the pocket. They wanted her to show up every week and keep the family name good. So um, they're happy with this sort of brokered piece. But it's another kind of crisis in which she sort of finds her way to kind of smooth things over in a way, but also keep her rebellion alive. She, she, I don't know if you want to call it half measures, but her agreement to go back to church, even after she said she doesn't believe it, and she doesn't want to go to church, is a little bit of a, I don't know, a, a reconciliation, but a little bit of giving up of herself. Right? Um, and this is sort of how evangelicalism had been in the first place. It was an acceptable way for her to rebel. She's found another sort of acceptable way to rebel, in a sense. Um, so in 
Um, I don't know if the translation part is normal, you know, if not everyone goes out and translates a book. But just aside from that, this is, you know, relatively normal. She felt she needed recuperation after spending so much time nursing her father, and that was one of the stated reasons for going off to uh, the continent, to kind of recover uh, from the physical uh, difficulty of nursing for someone. Um, so when she comes back from Geneva, she kind of she moves to London and becomes part of a sort of vibrant intellectual life of London. This is the, this is the sort of the best, this is Elliot coming into her own. She becomes an assistant uh, editor for one of the leading journals, intellectual journals of the day, the Westminster Review, which means she's working with all the leading thinkers in England of the top, right? Um, she's helping them edit, uh, she's helping put the journal together. She, she, the journal's publisher, John Chapman, and she have a very close relationship. Again, some people think there was a sexual affair. It's not clear. Is she using her name at this time, Mary Evans? So, at this point, um, the translation is under her name, um, which isn't, you know, so shocking because it's a translation in a way. When she's working at the journal, she doesn't really have a public role, so it almost doesn't matter. As assistant editor, she's not listed anywhere. Um, so, she's, so she's, I mean, she's using Marianne Evans. She's not yet publishing under George Eliot. Um, that will happen when she first publishes Scenes from Clerical Life, which is her first novel. Um, Can you read that just one? Sure. Oh. So after her relationship with Chapman, another really important figure, uh, another leading intellectual at the time, was uh, Herbert Spencer, who's a philosopher sociologist, also working in the Westminster Review. And she writes to him, they spend a lot of time together. She writes to him and says, ask him, always, quote, always be with me as much as you can and share your thoughts and feelings with me. Um, I suppose that no woman ever before wrote such a letter as this, as this but I am not ashamed of it. I mean, interestingly, she, if you look at the letter, she's almost proposing marriage to him. Um, which, again, not a lot of, I mean, this was not acceptable behavior for Victorian women, and she, she recognizes that. She feels like, yes, I know you're gonna, you know, you're gonna make fun of me or whatever for writing a letter like this, where she exposes herself so clearly, right, and asks him for so much, right? No woman has ever before written a letter like this. Right? Um, but this, she felt very strongly about him, and he basically writes back and says, yeah, let's just be friends. Um, yeah, so th this is really hard on uh, her because she really felt as if they had this important, significant relationship. He did too, but not, not he didn't want to marry her. Um, but, but again, it shows Eliot's sort of emotional intensity, right, and her, ability, and her willingness to act on that emotional intensity. Right, to do something really which was considered really radical for her. I mean, imagine she's this woman living alone by herself in London, working at a journal, and she writes to someone she works with and says, I want us to be together always. It's a really vulnerable position for her to be in. Um, but at the same time, it's also part of a mid-Victorian kind of reassessment of women's roles. Right, and greater autonomy. I mean, we can see this even in the Charles and Cara Gray relationship. You know, the fact that they, were, they had this open relationship. Uh, there was the idea emerging that women should, should have more autonomy over their lives. And Eliot kind of comes at the right moment in a way, although perhaps a little too early, but at the right moment at the cutting edge of what's going on in terms of women's autonomy. So she notes another relationship with someone else also at the Westminster Review, George Henry Lewes. This is a picture of Lewes. This is after she recovers from Spencer. Um, the, the problem for Lewes and Evans is that he's already married. He has uh, three children. Um, Agnes had begun an affair with 
Hunt, who also worked on the Westminster Review, or and worked on a, another publication together. Um, she had had four children with Thornton Hunt, her lover, all of whom Luz takes under his name, right? And what that does, because he had not, because he takes her children under his name and he hadn't, um, hadn't uh, filed for divorce or anything like that, um, he gives up his ability to divorce. In other words, there's no, he has no legal standing to have a, to, uh, proceed with the divorce at this point once he's accepted the fact, once it's shown that he's accepted the fact of his wife's uh, infidelity. So this, and this will all happen more or less before Luz and Evans thought of getting together or, or needed to do each other. So they're in this, you know, very difficult situation. He can't get a divorce. It's not really acceptable for them to be a couple because he's married to someone else even though she's having an affair with a third person. Um, but they sort of, you know, being at the sort of cutting intellectual edge of their time, they sort of look at each other and say, you know, we're in love, we want to be married, what difference does it make uh, that the law is on our side or not? And they decide to go off to Germany for eight months together, which they really don't tell a lot of people about. She certainly doesn't tell her brother Isaac. She doesn't tell family back home. She doesn't tell the Braves. She doesn't tell any of her former friends, really, um, or just very abruptly. And then when they return, they set up house together. And she, from that point on, refers to herself as Mary Evan, Marianne Evans Lutz. She takes his last name in all of her correspondence um, and any documents she's producing. Um, and, it's, and, and, and people know, she's shunned. People won't see her. You know, uh, people, even former friends, won't come visit her. Uh, you know, and, and there's a difference between the Braves, who haven't acknowledged affairs, but are living as man and wife, as opposed to Elliot or Evans and Luz who are unmarried and living together, right? There's a difference in the kind of level of public acknowledgement of those kinds of relationships. It's one thing to have an affair with someone who lives somewhere else. It's another thing to live unmarried together. Yeah. You said that Liz accepted his wife's uh, children from her lover. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, at first glance, it was seen that he was really more of a family guy and wanted to keep the family together. But then when he runs off with Mary Evans, it seems like he's tossed it all aside. Well, and she actually, um, uh, she acknowledges his children. And when they, when they leave in the house together, they're living with all, when Marianne and George are living together, they're living with all the children. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And so it's super radical in a way. Well, where's the wife? Where's Agnes? I don't know. I'm not sure what happens to Agnes at that point. I don't know if she goes off with Thornton. Hunt, or she goes so somewhere he, else. He's, he's really focused on making sure his children are intact with the dad. Yeah, I mean, Except for yes, and, and he, he himself has a sort of checker. I'm not sure if he's illegitimate or there was some sort of um, a controversy over his parents in his past. So I think that's part of why he is devoted to the kids. Um, he also, again, feels like he believes in all these sort of newfangled ideas. Right? And, and he feels like it would be hypocritical for him to say, you know, I believe in, you know, thinking about the role of women in the household, but to keep my wife, um, you know, but to divorce my wife um, if she doesn't want it is unacceptable to him. So Wait, did, did Mary Evans take care of the children? Yes, yeah, yeah. She's like a stepmom. I mean, she's a stepmom, but they're, they're quite older at this point. They, yeah. How do they? Um, I don't know the details of that part. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, he—I mean, it's relatively accepted, and I think Agnes acknowledges that yeah, you know, these are Thornton Hunt's children. Well, but, but obviously, I'm sure there could be discrepancies. Yeah, especially before you know any kind of testing. So, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it's—it's it's common knowledge, and they—they they all at least acknowledge that this is the truth, whether it's the actual truth or not. Uh, 
So, um, her brother Isaac, and this will be important again when you're reading the Long the Plaza, once he eventually hears of this, he doesn't, you know, she really doesn't, she doesn't obviously, she doesn't write to her family and say, I am living with Mary, uh, with George Henry Lewis, even though he's married to another woman. She presents it as a marriage to her family, or she skirts the issue in a way. But when her brother Isaac finds out, when she admits to him, yes, we're living together, we're unmarried, he doesn't even respond. He has his lawyer write to her and says, from this point on, there will be no contact between you and me. Uh, and again, this was the closest relationship of her early life, was with her brother Isaac. Um, we haven't heard a lot, but like, she was always very tied to Isaac. This was a sharp divide in her life between um, sort of being part of the community, and this is sort of almost her final rebellion, right? Um, Isaac won't talk to her, won't even correspond with her. She doesn't really tell a lot of people back home what's going on. She's more or less cut off. People, even like, people like the Braves won't visit her, right? Even people who are having affairs, yeah. right? And you, you can sort of see how she feels about the hypocrisy of society and the following of tradition and the level of gossip. I mean, she's someone who feels like she's following her emotional truth, right? While everyone else is sort of, you know, sleeping around in a sense, right? And she's the one who's ostracized from society. She's doing what she wants. You know, she she at least is being honest, I mean, in her mind, and truthful in what she's doing. Um, whereas everyone else is sort of doing it behind the scenes. Yeah. Well, person. Pardon me for interrupting the discussion of the personal and private lives of these people, but uh, can we hear a little bit about how she shapes her use of the form of the novel and the relation she sets up between reader and text? Yes, I, I decided when I, when I was going through this and kind of ended up telling the story of her uh, biography that I would save those pieces for our discussion next time um, when, we, when we read the novel. I think it would be a little easier and we'll have more time to kind of talk about the relationship she sets up between novel and reader. Although one of the things I will say about Eliot that, that's sort of related to this is one of her big goals in her novel writing was to separate the novel out from public entertainment. That's why she would have been so pleased by being seen as a philosopher. Uh, she was very concerned that novels would be seen as um, non unproductive, as uh, unethical, sort of like yes, they're going to learn something from this novel whether you like it or not. Um, or this novel is going to raise the public discourse. Right? And again, it's a very precarious position for someone who's shunned by society for being uh, unethical. Right? To say. Are you well, I mean, Hawthorne was one person kind of writing, you know, at a similar time to her, but he's one of many. And, and most of us, I mean, George Eliot has this famous piece called uh, Silly Women Novelists. Most of the novels that are being published at the time, you know, are not Hawthorne, right? And, and particularly by women. So one of her concerns is how to be a woman, how to be a woman who's shunned by society, and be taken seriously as an author with. Um, Lisa May Alcott, Vicious and Perry. She is earlier, but she's but she's not. I mean, Lisa May Alcott is not as sort of, I guess, high toned and knowledgeable <laughs> as Elliot, right? I mean, she's she's writing more acceptable uh, female fiction than Elliot is. She's writing mostly about women. You said the love characters that became a writer, which was unconventional at that time. I'm sorry. And the Little Women, one of the characters became a writer, which is, you know. It's unconventional, but not unheard of. Mm -hmm. um, and again, when Elliot wanted to make the distinction was being a writer and being a serious writer. She wanted to be taken seriously like Chapman and Spencer um, and Luz, these men who weren't writing fiction, 
but were writing sort of philosophical, sociological investigations. She wanted her novels to be on par and, equal, and seen as equal to those. She, she didn't like the idea that people would see her novels as just entertainment. Yeah? I thought Little Wise Mayaka was writing Penny Dreadfuls and children's books, which is quite a different Yeah, way. yeah. So it, it's, I mean, Eliot is, again, her, her purpose is always to teach us something and make us better people, uh, not to entertain. And she was always nervous she would be put in the category of women writers who entertain us. Or, or writers who entertain us, and then the lower category even of women writers who entertain us. Right? So she wanted, to, again, she wanted to be on, her novels to be on par with Chapman and those other intellectuals. And the point of the scandal, yeah. everyone's shedding her. Did yeah. this cause a problem in terms of her uh, career and, and publication? How was she right. writing? So she publishes Scenes of Clerical Life and um, Adam Bede under George Eliot before it's really known that she's who George Eliot is. Yeah, so the student had protected her. Right. Both of those, particularly Adam Bede, was an immediate bestseller um, that, in fact, uh, Queen Victoria was quite fond of. Um, so she had already established her career under George Eliot when people began, and then there's a whole sort of investigation as to who George Eliot really was. Um, because someone else from her hometown claimed to be George Eliot. And she and Luz were sort of happy to let that lie out there for a while because it kept them out of the spotlight. Her publisher was even more happy because he was really nervous that once people found out these novels were being written by Marianne Evans, Luz, that sales would drop. So what they do is they sort of let things go on long enough for her career to be solidly established before people start making the connections between Marianne Evans and George Eliot. By that time, it's still controversial, but she has sort of a, set up a place for herself in society. We're talking um, 15 years later. Uh, by the time Middlemarch is published, it's not that everyone agrees you know, she's done the right thing, but there is enough of a kind of longevity to the situation, I think, that people begin to accept it. Although her brother Isaac never accepts it until Luz dies, she remarries <laughs> legitimately. Then he writes her a note saying, you know, let's get together. I'd love to see you sometime. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was wondering if she has solved that problem this before yeah. Luz dies. By getting married to somebody who needed to be married. And then probably she, and then, then, and then, she could, then she could have her husband. <laughs> right, right. That would have been more acceptable, as we know. Yes, That's I, I sort of the Charles and Carol Gray situation. As long as you didn't publicly acknowledge it, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. But that wasn't George Eliot. Right. No, she was going to acknowledge it, in other words, no matter what. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. That I mean that's what's you sort of uh, interesting and unique, and it's not that Victorians didn't have affairs, it's not that Victorians didn't re know that everyone was, that people were having affairs, and not that they didn't set up alternate relationships, right? It was sort of common knowledge and accepted in a lot of ways, it's just that you were not allowed to make it explicit in certain ways. Um, so, and she doesn't, right? Yeah, she doesn't, right. Um, but it, and I, I want to come back to, you know, and then we can talk a little bit more, but I want to come back to the, just the whole quote we started with, this idea of, uh, you know, the sort of being interested in political and social change, but also attached to older traditions, right? I mean, what's interesting, even in how she handles the relationship with Luz, is she carries it out as if it were a marriage. You know, she's sort of like this, one woman truth squad in a way, right? Like, this is going to be my definition of marriage. And you, you know, I don't care more or less how you see it, but I am married in my mind. And she, and for, you know, exactly the same, she does not go behind, you know, society's back and do, do this. And it, it's sort of interesting because it does go back to she is really attached to the old system. It's not like she's saying marriage doesn't work, which there were Victorians at the time saying marriage doesn't work. 
she doesn't go that way, right? She does both at the same time. She redefines marriage for herself, but and carries out in a very traditional way. Luz and Evan's marriage is more or less traditional. There's nothing shocking or surprising about it if he didn't have a uh, wife that he couldn't get divorced from. Um, they lived together. Uh, he was, you know, more of a public figure. She was very shy and retiring. She didn't like people. She didn't like people visiting her. She didn't like society. Um, he was more of the public face of the couple. Um, so there's nothing, you know, I won't say there's nothing, but there's not a lot that's shocking about their marriage, other than the fact that it wasn't a marriage. So she still has that sort of holding on to the traditional on one hand and kind of having social change or acknowledging or accepting or putting forward social change at the same time. In a sense, I think she, she, you could say she wants it both ways. She never wants to give up to the, the old, but she's always kind of pushing it forward. Um, and I think you see that in Middlemarch, you see that in Yolanda Floss, you see that in all of her novels, that she's very torn, or there's that productive tension between her beliefs in tradition and her willingness to explore change. She never comes out on one side or the other, right, which is maybe what makes her novels so long. <laughs> Right? Because there's a lot of time spent exploring tradition. And there's a lot of time spent exploring how people <coughs> move away from tradition. But it never comes down on one side or the other. She never says, I mean, or I think at least, her novels never say, we need to get rid of tradition. And yet they never say, we need to prevent social change. She's always doing both at once. Yeah? I haven't read any of the books yet, but and her, the first book, was that Middlemarch? Oh, well, uh, no, Middlemarch comes later. Uh, Scenes from Clerical Life, uh, Adam Bede, Silas Marner, and then Mill on the Blossom. So, whatever the first book was, yes. did she use the pen name then? Yes. She uses George Eliot for Scenes from Clerical Life. So, she, she did that because she didn't think she would get published, or they wouldn't publish? Um, she did it because she didn't think she would get published. She didn't want the notoriety. And she didn't want people to see her as a female, didn't want people to read her as a female author. She was concerned that if people read her as a female author, they wouldn't take her seriously. So, I mean, there were other women writing under, under their own names at the time, so it wouldn't be impossible, but she had a number of concerns about doing so. She felt if she, would people have read her seriously as a woman novel? Is that? Well, look at the content. Um, what did I do? I think, um, I mean, I suppose people would have taken her seriously. I, given everything, it's probably better that she started off with George Eliot, uh, given how the whole thing with Lou's mushrooms, and you know, um, I think if she had written as, if everyone had known she was an unmarried woman living with a man, um, it would have been more difficult for her to establish her name. Um, because of that. Maybe yeah. she didn't have that part of the past, and that would be easier to publish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and she continues, all of her publications, even after it's well known that Mary Ann Evans is writing them, she continues to publish under the name George Evans. She never changes that, um, which is interesting. The yeah. only thing that's under her name is that first translation. I mean, J.K. Rowling is doing that today, as Robert Galbraith or whatever. As an alternate. And then, yeah. that, conversely, there's a new book out, Woman in the Window, uh, written by somebody with the initials in their name. It's actually yeah. a man, but he writes like right. all these other women right. that are writing the girl right. books. So, I mean, it's still, it's a tradition that's been yeah. going on for hundreds of years. I mean, I think there is a sort of, but embedded in this is a question of what is George Eliot's attitude towards women? Um, and I, I think, you know, there's a, we can read, when we read Mel Clause, we can talk about this maybe more, but there's a case to be made that she is maybe over, I think, People have said she's overly critical of women, and that there's a kind of um, there's a kind of maybe defensiveness on her part and in her writing about women. Um, Was she overly critical of traditional women or just women? Well, let's say there's always, you know, there's off, there are silly women don't come off very well or sympathetically to that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, yeah, maybe. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that's a question. I mean, Jane Austen. Yeah. It's the same. Yeah. But Jane Austen didn't like anyone, so. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think you can make, I mean, I think it's worth thinking about how, what Eliot's ideas about women in general are, um, and whether she sees herself to what extent she sees herself as an exception, and to what extent she sees herself as uh, like all other women, but just with um, greater uh, opportunities. Um, I mean, I think that's an open question. I mean, so yeah, I'll just throw that out there for reading Bill on the Fly. Especially when we think about, again, when we come back together and we think about Maggie, it'll be a really interesting question about Maggie Tulliver. And the extent to which Maggie Tulliver, um, uh, I, was going, I won't be a spoiler, but is the cause of her own problems, and the extent to which Maggie Tulliver has her problems caused for her, as a sort of test about how Elliot sees about sees women and her possible defensiveness about them. Well, probably, that sounds kind of like most people in life to me. In what way? Our personalities cause problems for us, and yet yes. luck, yes. good or bad fortune, yeah. political climate affect yeah. everything we do as well. Yeah. yeah, and I think there's a way in which, you know, Elliot, as a female writer, can, can be particularly harsh on women who aren't as smart as her. Um, in a way, she's not as harsh on men who aren't as smart as her. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I don't know, Stephanie's giving me quizzical looks, okay. Right. I think it's an interesting question, yeah. Well, I think she questions the status quo of almost everything, whether it's religion or society or, or male or female roles or physicians or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That she really, and rather than just satirizing something as being completely bad, she manages to analyze it, so yes, she steps she back both sides of yes. a question or a, a role in society. Yes, and I think that ties back to her philosopher impulses, mm -hmm. right? Like, and, and she makes an attempt to sort of understand everyone in everyone's position. But they, I, again, I guess I do wonder, like, you know, when someone from a particular minority comes out and speaks for them, there's often the, they often try. There's often the sense that you know a defensiveness about that position. It's a tough position to be in. And I think Elliot, as a, woman, a female intellectual, is in that position. Um, so this does give us plenty of talk to talk about for next time, which is the narrative voice and the structure of her novels, as well as the role of women and the treatment of women, her attitude towards women. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking a question on this, what we were talking today. And uh, since we're discussing the different roles between the two genders, we have a female, yeah. my question earlier was, she was ordered to come back and be the slave running the house, and yet, and I wonder, was that traditional? And then yes. when the brother got married, she was kicked out. Yes. The brother was able to take the house over. Yep. Was that the tradition? Yes. Yeah, yes. Be. So it was all determined by who was you know, the oldest male and the oldest woman. So as the oldest woman in the immediate family, once her mother dies, she becomes caretaker. Once she is replaced by her brother's husband and wife, then she is no longer has a role. I mean, she could have stayed, but would have, been, would have been probably the worst position was to be an unmarried female in another woman's house. She would have had least power and least control over her life. Well, I'm wondering why could they found the house of the Rome and let her inherit that nice big one? Right, so she goes up with her father, okay. and that's the best she can do. I mean, she I mean, was the system, it was the tradition. Yes, yes. <laughs> that was, uh, you know, she was brought back from school before Isaac got married, is that? Exactly, her mother uh, dies, so she's brought back to school. Daughter, but then the men die. Then yeah. Isaac gets married, yeah, that's the chronology. What happens to the, where's the third child? The younger sister? Uh, she has a younger sister, Chrissy, and um, I think she would need to come home as the younger daughter. I'm not sure if she continued at school. I, I believe she did, but I have to check that. But as, again, as the younger, youngest daughter, she wouldn't necessarily have a role in the household or in the, in the caring of the household.
So again, birth order and gender are super important in a sort of traditional uh, society, like the one she was living in. Even though maybe her younger sister would have been much better at this, right? This is getting off track of Noam's boss, but I was curious your opinion of whether there are autobiographical elements in Middlemarch, and I'm thinking of Mr. Garth and the Happy Family. Yeah. 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 And even there's a couple of passages where the two younger siblings are being taught by the mom. Yeah. The little girl is obviously smarter, but the mom favors the little boy. Yes. Yeah. And that's exactly, I mean, the Garth, the Garth family, the Garth family is yeah. exactly the kind of family, you know, she would know and she would come from. That sort of rural family that nonetheless has, um, is not the lowest rung, but it's not the highest rung in the middle. That's, that would be the family, that would be the, you know, and the Garth family often has a sort of nostalgia for that family, even though I think you're pointing out, you know, the role of women in it are, you know, or the daughter is, is sort of, Different, but um, there is a certain nostalgia for that kind of family in uh, Elliot's novels. Yeah, when the father said, it's, it's just so curious that my son is so good looking and my daughter is so smart, and how could that possibly happen? Right. Why? <laughs> <laughs> right. right. <laughs> and, and at the same time, you can see in those, those rural families in Middle March, you know, those middle class rural families, where the mother often has a great deal of power. And not always, but depending on their personality. Yeah. Yeah, depending on their personalities, can often have a great deal of power and influence. Um, so Elliot knows those families very well and knows the sort of um, how power works in them and you know the ways in which it's not easy to figure that out. Yeah. And that'll compare to the Dot all of the Dodson family in uh Hill and the Floss. A very traditional rural family uh, where women actually have a great deal of power. I think we're out of time. Sure. Hey, unless anyone has something else to put on the list for next time or questions? Well, no. I think I heard from someone in the, in the um, Elliot's room who didn't have the same recognize that it was written by a female. He, he, he wrote to Elliot and said yes. I, I, read I believe, well, because there was some controversy once they tried to put her name forward. Um, some, there were some people who still believed it was a man, and Dickens said, no, I believe you. This was written by a woman. Huh. Was she contemporary with the uh, Brontes? She is uh, older than, I mean, she comes later than the Brontes. Later. The Brontes are sort of a generation before her, oh, more or less. Uh, Jane Austen, Jane Austen, and so, so Jane Austen, then Brontes, then Ellie. Is there a reason I selected the book? Well, Dave and I chatted about doing Elliot, and we felt like Mill on the Floss was an uh, accomplishable task, I think. <laughs> we were a little nervous of taking on Middle March. Uh, we let that to Stephanie. Uh, no. uh, yeah, I think that was, I mean, again, I, but my real favorite novel is Dan, uh, Elliot novel is Daniel Rock. Mm -hmm. Daniel Yeah. And Romola is also great, or Romola. Why yeah. do you like that particular novel the best? Because I've read that from various critics, too. Other I, critics. I think it's the most complicated. It's the only one set in the present. So it's like Elliot is dealing with the most kind of pressing issues. There's less of a sort of feeling of, I think, nostalgia that there sometimes is, sometimes is in the other novels of like cute little characters. There are some cute little characters. But the, the main characters are really gripped by very Pressing and real, realistically, realistic feeling problems. I think. Listen, Daniel Deronda. But Bill on the Floss, I love too. I don't want to say that, you know. I mean, you know, I mean, just re read it, you know. Um, I remember how much I really love it because it is. I mean, if Bill on the Floss doesn't make you cry, <laughs> you are you are a hard-hearted person. That's all I have to say. <laughs> But get ready for tears, though. Yeah. Uh, how much did having a female monarch make a difference in this era? There's a lot of discussion of that, um, and 
the answer is good and bad. Um, that, you know, Victoria didn't, um, in many ways, didn't press uh, women, right, you know, did not believe in women having the vote. Um, but, you know, the idea is still an important one, the idea that you have a female leader to the country. Um, so it's a, it's a mixed bag. You know, in some ways, maybe like Elliot herself. All right. That's fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.